Well, logging first took place in the, in the Great Bear Rainforest about a hundred years ago. And the companies would, would get a forest tenure by making an application to the provincial government, who was the owner of the, of the forest, his public crown land. From the province's point of view, there were two benefits that came from these tenures. One was revenue in the form of uh, taxes and, and rental fees, and the other one was the creation of jobs. You know, in the, in the early 90s to the mid 90s, uh, the industry was uh, operating in the Great Bear Rainforest and had been for quite a long while. But there were 100 uh, pristine or intact valleys uh, in the area. And the environmental organization said, you know, we really don't want any logging in those pristine areas. And the industry, of course, was saying, well, that's our future. You know, we need to log in those areas. And that was really, that defined, if you can, the difference between the perspective of the companies and the perspective of the environmental organizations was the fate and the future of those hundred pristine valleys. You know, one of the things that was a surprise to the forest industry was the, was the demonstrations or the protests that happened on the ground, whether it was in Roderick Island or King Island, because those places were so far away and remote. Uh, people in the industry figured that the environmentalists would just never get there. Logistically, it would be uh, too difficult. I was actually at the site in Roderick. I always kind of remember it. It was quite funny. Um, there was a, the crew at this site came on the radio and said, there's people in white coveralls coming out of the forest. <laughs> And so uh, the foreman said, stop what you're doing, lock your machine down, and get out of there. And we drove up to the site, and there were, in fact, uh, you know, half a dozen or so Greenpeace activists by that time had bicycle locked themselves to various pieces of the equipment. And uh, that went on for 10 days. Now, the whole conversation there uh, was between Greenpeace, Western Forest Products, and the uh, Kittisu First Nation. Um, and that was a very interesting development and it really taught people an awful lot about, I think, the beginnings of how you can have a dialogue rather than just simply conflict. Let there be no doubt that what got the attention of the industry were the market campaigns. When the environmental organizations were in the marketplace in Europe and the United States talking with customers uh, and those customers were coming back and asking questions of their suppliers, the forest companies, that started to get people's attention. And especially when uh, customers started to say, you know, we may just choose to go elsewhere. But it truly got the, the attention of, uh, of the industry. In fact, in 1999, there was a meeting of uh, coastal forest companies to talk about that very subject and say, what are we going to do? And the, the conclusion of that meeting is we have to do something different. And one of the things we need to do is engage with our critics and engage with the environmental groups. And that began the discussions between the companies and the environmental organizations. You know, it was very interesting. When we first sat down, uh, mostly you, you were dealing with people who hadn't been in the room with one another. Uh, and so there was a lot of tension. You could kind of cut the air in those, in those early meetings. People were lined up on opposite sides of the table. You know, the industry folks on one side and the environmental groups on the other. But you get to the point where you realize that you actually can have some trust, and you can have some respect, and you can guess what, you can hold each other accountable. So the Great Bear Rainforest Agreements led to two significant outcomes. One was a protected areas, about a third of the area was, was formally protected in parks and conservancies. But the other big piece is that outside of those protected areas, if there's gonna be any development work, it's gonna be under the guidance of ecosystem-based management, which is a scientific approach to managing forests in a way that uh, protects the values inherent in those forests, even if you're doing some logging. I was a logger, that's what I originally, that's how I got involved in all of this business, was as a logger. And I had a very jaundiced view of environmental groups and environmental campaigns to start with. I certainly have a very different attitude when it comes to uh, the environmental community. I'm able to uh, appreciate and understand the role of the environmental community. And frankly, I would not want to see a world where there wasn't a Greenpeace or where there wasn't a World Wildlife Fund or there wasn't a uh, Rainforest Action Network. That needs to be there. It's part of the mix and it's part of what makes us, helps us to do the right thing. 
I think one big thing that the industry learned is that these old growth rainforests are, are, are important in and of themselves and they're important to society and people around the world. They're not just a, um, a reservoir of commodities. They are much, much more than that. And, you know, it's really important that the industry came to be able to say without blushing that the Great Bear Rainforest is a globally significant area and it's an important area worthy of protection.